Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Johannes V. Jensen's novel, The Fall of the King, translated from the Danish by Alan G. Bauer and published by University of Minnesota Press. This book was originally published in three volumes in the years 1900 and 1901. And I picked up this book because I've been doing a bunch of research on Danish literature, and this book just kept coming up. It was named the greatest novel of the 20th century in Denmark by two different Danish newspapers in 1999. It's included in the Danish cultural canon, etc. It's a really highly regarded book in Denmark, though Jensen doesn't seem to have broken through to an international audience the same way as some of his other Scandinavian contemporaries have. Jensen was born in 1873 and is often referred to as the father of Danish modernism, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1944. He was a pretty prolific writer from around the turn of the century when Koningsberg, The Fall of the King, was published, and he continued to write um, essays, novels, poems, um, even a series of myths in a volume that he called Myths, um, many of which are based on his travels to the Far East, sort of Rudyard Kipling style. And he wrote in all these different styles, but he always had a very kind of grandiose vision for himself and for literature. He's often retelling myths and recreating myths and historical stories and historical legends, much like, you know, most modernists. This is a very modernist idea to do this. Um, and it ties into perhaps his most grand work, which is um, a six-volume book called The Long Journey, which I just have the first three volumes. And this series, The Long Journey, is essentially a fictional history of mankind from the Paleolithic era to the modern era. It sort of takes a teleological approach, um, depicting the evolution or progression of mankind. It seems ambitious, if nothing else. But the reason why I saw a review of The Fall of the King um, by referencing these other works is to sort of map out the artistic and political vision that Jensen had, as it sort of sets up the kinds of things that he's interested in this book. In The Fall of the King, he focuses on a specific time period in Danish and Scandinavian history. And we actually need to do a bit of history before we actually talk about the book, because if you're unfamiliar with the history, you're going to have no idea what this book is even doing. Jensen really takes for granted that you know the history that he's talking about, and he never comes out and fully explains what's really going on. The Fall of the King takes place during the reign of King Christian II, in the early 16th century, um, who reigned over the Kalmar Union in Scandinavia, effectively ruling what is now Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Though the Kalmar Union was a bit more like a confederacy than anything else. The three states were separate, but they were effectively governed by a single king. And the Kalmar Union was well over 100 years old by the time Christian came to power, um, but it is during his reign that the Kalmar Union collapsed mainly due to rebellions or wars or whatever you want to call them um, with Sweden. And these wars included Christian uh, conquering Sweden and brutally executing um, a bunch of the Swedish noblemen in an event that, that is now called the Stockholm bloodbath. This event, of course, didn't really sit well with the Swedes, um, who now referred to Christian as Christian Tyran, Christian the Tyrant. And so basically began the Swedish War for Liberation, where they crowned their own king, deposed Christian in Sweden, etc. And in response to this, Christian sort of goes back to Denmark to reassert his rule in Denmark. And he begins passing all of these laws that weakened the noblemen and the clergy in favor of the lower classes and himself, the king, which obviously didn't really go over too well. The noblemen revolted and Christian had to fled into exile to the, the Netherlands. He did try to come back to reclaim the throne, but he was eventually captured and imprisoned by his own noblemen, and he spent the rest of his life in prison, where he eventually died in 1559. And the death of Christian II is really the end of an era. The Kalmar Union, like I said, was formed in the 14th century, and it lasted until the beginning of the 16th. It maintained control over mainland Scandinavia, as well as Iceland, Greenland, and, you know, the Orkney Isles and the, the, the Faroe Islands. And it did so from what we now call the Middle Ages to what we now call the pre-modern world. That is, when this union fell apart, Europe was beginning to go through all of these monumental shifts like the Protestant Reformation, as well as other uh, geopolitical issues that were propelling Europe into what we now call the pre-modern world. So this book is about that history the fall of Christian II, the fall of the Kalmar Union, and the fall of what was the dominant political ideologies that ran throughout the Middle Ages. But it's also not about any of that at all. 
um, because all of that really happens in the background, occasionally far, far in the background. But you need to be aware of this history in order to make any sense of this book, as again, he never really explains that this history is going on in the background. You kind of get very small glimpses into it, and you have to kind of met, uh, put the pieces together. The Fall of the King is really about this guy named Mikkel Toyesen, and forgive my Danish pronunciation, um, who at the beginning of this book is a disenchanted college student in Copenhagen who ends up kind of dropping out of school, joining a um, mercenary contingent in the military, and becoming close to the king while they both spend time in prison. And like I noted at the beginning, this book is really three books um, split into three main narrative strands in chapters called The Death of Spring, The Great Summer, and Winter. You can probably already kind of see, especially just based on the history that uh, I just talked about, uh, the trajectory of this book. Throughout, throughout his life, Mikkel serendipitously kind of keeps coming in contact with Christian II, um, and there are two, these two lives of Mikkel and Christian sort of orbit each other. Um, and so we witness these massive historical moments like the Stockholm bloodbath that I mentioned earlier, um, or the capture and imprisonment of King Christian II, um, all from the perspective of Mikkel, who again has like varying degrees of connection to these events. Sometimes he's actively involved and actively in stating these events, and other times he kind of just hears about them from another person in a tavern or something like that. And so this gives us a really distorted view of history that's quite interesting, um, especially as Mikkel is, well, an awful person in so many ways. He gets caught up in personal vendettas, especially over women, which takes up quite a bit, quite a fair bit of the page count. But this revenge narrative is actually really compelling and psychologically deep as it mirrors the fall of Christian, as Mikkel um, is sort of falling because he can't stop thinking about revenge. But really quick, for me, one of the big problems with this book is the depiction of women. Um, it's not good, like really not good. <laughs> I'm used to reading really old stuff that doesn't have our, you know, enlightened view of gender and gender relations and stuff like that. Uh, but even still, there are some weird scenes in this book, um, and the women are just really just treated as blatant objects on which the male characters peacock. But anyways, with that said, the prose in this book is absolutely astounding. It often reads like a prose poem, and I say often because the prose moves between, very fluidly, between this poetic and beautiful flourish that, well, many modernists wield, and a kind of just brutal realism that depicts the harshness of life in this history. In an afterword by, by Sven H. Uh, Rosso, um, which isn't in this vo volume, I had to get it through interlibrary loan, um, but Rosso writes that Jensen blends the dream passages of exquisite lyrical beauty with explosive, ruthless, naturalistic scenes. And this is exactly what I want to turn to, what I kind of want to focus on for a little bit. Early on in this book, Mikkel starts having these dreams of him falling. And obviously, this is important uh, considering the name of the book and the history that we just went over. Um, this book is about the fall of a king and a kingdom and the Kalmar Union, but it's also about the fall of a single man, Mikkel. Mikkel dreamed that he was climbing a great precipitous mountain, floundering and nearly buried in the loose snow. When he had almost reached the top, he sat down, exhausted. High above him, the path that sloped down to the left. Just to get this much higher up, he, he would have to climb a long way, clear around the mountain. He had given up, and now he was sitting with both legs planted firmly in the snow. Everything was finished. The path above him was a maelstrom of shiver, shimmering whiteness, with the whole of the mountain's powdery snow being churned up from the ground. And these premonitions keep happening as we kind of witness Mikkel sort of try to climb the ladder of the social hierarchy, but he keeps falling and keeps actually descending as he's climbing this ladder of social hierarchy. And actually just later in this chapter, uh, Mikkel is staying on his farm and a horse on his farm just recently died. So he starts thinking about this other time that one of his neighbor's horse or, uh, horses died. Uh, and we get this description of this decaying corpse be before moving on to something else. The earth took the head first, and then the carcass sank down as the tension went out of its hawks. Yes, yes, the earth knows all, even though it remains silent. We have our way for a time, and the more light-hearted we are, the more we dance about on it. But all flesh is created in defiance of nature, in opposition to the law of gravity. Humans have even lifted their forequarters up from the earth, cheating gravity out of a couple of limbs. 
God fattens up living things so that they will fall even harder to the earth. For God and Satan are one and the same person, but the earth. Nicholas sees a helpless infant lying at his feet on the earth, and the image is vivid. It is lying on its back like a fetus, with its arms and legs folded. But now it is growing before his very eyes, so fast that he can't follow all the details at once. First, there is a pair of wide open alert eyes looking up at him, with delicate white arms lying at the side of the body. See how long the legs have grown. The face is clouded by sorrow, then a smile flits over the features, and then joyful cruelty, fear, indecision. The hands are already large and brown. Just as he looks from the toes up to the head, a beard spreads across his jaw like a dark cloud, the brow arches in anguish. It is a grown man now, lying still for a moment, preoccupied with its inner world. And then he is already old. His beard is turning gray, his hair is disappearing, and his sharp knees stick up in the air. He is all wrinkles now, for his flesh has wasted away under his skin. And suddenly, the piteousness of age is framed in black. There is a glimpse of yellowed legs, and then the coffin lid fuses shut as the earth rain downs on it. Yes, the earth reclaims its own. It flings them down and stretches them out on its crust. Just get a hole in you somewhere, and your ribs will slap the earth. You will smack the ground like a post whose base has rotted away. It's a pretty gruesome scene, but it's also, I think, a beautiful meditation on the transitoriness of life. It's, it actually reminds me quite a bit of the Ubi Sunt motif in a lot of Old English poetry, and this idea that Old English poets just love, that all material things will die and, and rot away. Check out the Old English The Wanderer or The Ruin if you want to know uh, what I'm talking about, or just read Beowulf. It's all over Beowulf, especially the ending. So this first section of this book, we follow Mikkel as he kind of wanders around, dropping out of school and doesn't really know what he's doing. He falls in love with this girl, but then a man he knows, um, this guy he grew up with uh, near his farm, uh, assaults this girl. So Mikkel kind of just gives up on her and turns all of his attention to getting revenge on this man. So he leaves Copenhagen, goes back to the farmstead where he's from, finds the lover of the man who just assaulted the woman or the girl that uh, Mikkel liked, and he, Mikkel, assaults this girl. I know, it's really weird and pretty awful, honestly. But from here he goes off and enlists in the military, in, in this sort of mercenary contingent of the military, and the narrative jumps ahead. And again, if you're familiar with this history, you get a deeper understanding of this book, as Jensen, again, does take for granted that you understand it, um, which makes this book difficult to follow at times, as it jumps ahead in, in the narrative. Um, but from the perspective of Mikkel, we witness the fall of the Kalmar Union. But even the most profound truth, the diabolical truth, failed here. It could not save the North. The North man distinguishes himself by such a great aversion to happiness that it is precisely the most extreme and radical salvation that kills all hope forever. So mystical was the discord among the Nordic peoples, so obstinate their fate. The realms of the North burst into three parts, like a stone exploding in a fire. The date was November 7th, 1520. So again, we get this national history kind of in the background. And while it does occasionally take center stage, Jensen never loses sight of Miko, who, as I noted earlier, is falling in parallel to the Kalmar Union and to Christian II. There's a great line when Mikkel just witnessed the Stockholm bloodbath that I mentioned earlier, and he goes and stumbles into a church and sits down and, listen, and just starts listening to the organ music play. And he just thinks about his own loneliness. Yes, he had been lonely, and the man who is lonely is condemned. This becomes clear with time. Thought congeals as days and weeks pass disjointedly. All simple truths veer off and disappear. The invincible gifts that you perceive in yourself, with the proud thought that they reside only in you, these are weakened by doubt. Where is the power of your fantasy if it cannot sustain the world? You are like all the others, no stronger. And yet, it is your lot to be alone in this world. Yes, lonely. And I just love that last part in a, in a fictional book, right? Where is the power of your fantasy if it cannot sustain the world? So good. So we do get this deep psychology that is mapped onto this monumental moment in history. But for me, the best passages in this and the best reason to read this book 
are the passages that consider really grandiose questions like time and death. And I'll just read one more passage just because I think it's just phenomenal. This is from a chapter just called Time. Time passed and time prevailed. The days conquered all and the years spread like a contagious evil that lies beyond all power of human control. What folk resolved to do, they only half started. What they imagined would be completed one fine day. Time slung back at their feet as a fiasco. And now all of that had taken place long ago. Old people spoke of it as memories. Their first clumsy attempt were forsaken by time, and they became reality only when the sun spun its fire and ash into the following century. Men sank forgotten into the earth, but their tentative efforts at action remained as dim monuments along the road for all eternity. Their chronicle looked like a landscape after a flood, where the desolate earth is covered by heaps of rubble and black trees with their roots bared, and with salt and slime as far as the eye can reach. If you go to Jensen's Wikipedia page, it says under his legacy section, um, quote, without being a Danish answer to Kipling, Hamsun, or Sandberg, he bears comparison to all three authors. Not only is that just a really funny sentence, um, I think it's pretty fair. As you can probably tell, I wasn't particularly enthralled by this book, but I do think that Jensen um, is an incredible writer. His prose is gorgeous, and he has a strong command of narrative flow. And this book has by far enough just magnificent passages that I thought it was well worth talking about. And reading The Fall of the King did make me interested in his much longer six volume series, The Long Journey, um, just to see kind of what this is all about. But for now, let me know if you've read any of Jensen's works, especially if you're Danish. I'm, I'm really interested to see um, how Jensen is still read in Denmark specifically, if he's still held in such high regard. Um, but for now, thanks for watching.